The subject of this week's programme didn't get much of a chance to have a great life. He was killed in December of 1936, fighting against fascism in the Spanish Civil War, the day after his 21st birthday. He is John Cornford, political activist, soldier, poet, and nominating him today is the MP for Bethnal Green and Bow, George Galloway. An MP for a party partly of his own creation, the Respect Party, George comes from the left via the Labour Party from which he was finally expelled. His political life was galvanised by the sanctions, then the war against Iraq, to both of which he has been vehemently and eloquently opposed from the start. Criticised as a sadomite stooge by his former Labour colleagues, lionised, it's not too strong a term, by some of the anti-war movement, mocked for his appearance on Big Brother, he astonished a congressional committee in America with his attack on them and their questions. Called by Christopher Hitchens a Bathist, short ass, sub Leninist, East End carpetbagger, and calling Hitchens in return a drink soaked former Trotskyist popinjay who made natural history by metamorphosing from a butterfly into a slug, George Galloway, with whom I suspect I'd agree about almost nothing but Iraq, is, in my opinion, the finest British political orator of our age, and he loves language. So, George. In what order would you place John Cornford's legacy? Poet, soldier or activist? Well, activist, first of all, because he had the prescience to see that Spain was going to be one of the most decisive epochs in 20th century history and that fascism could and should be stopped there. And he became really the... Uh, nucleus of the International Brigade, the British section of which sent thousands of men from this country, about half of whom were either killed or wounded, and who I think represented our finest hour before our finest hour. They were people who wanted to stop fascism, who were ready to lay down their lives in a foreign land of which they knew little. There were no holiday programs then. Spain was as far away as Tasmania to most of the men, miners, factory workers, shipyard workers and so on who went there. Confer was the first to go. He was the first to argue in the councils of the left, principally of the Communist Party, of which he was a member, that it was worth the sacrifice. And uh, when I read his war poetry, I think it stands comparison with the very best of the, of the war poets. Um, he was, of course, uh, cut down in the very flower of his youth. He might have gone on to really great things. He might have become a very big political figure in Britain. We'll never know that. Let's listen to one of his poems. This is a reading from a poem written in Spain in 1936, A Letter from Aragon. This is a quiet sector of a quiet front. We buried Ruith in a new pine coffin, but the shroud was too small and his washed feet stuck out. The stink of his corpse came through the clean pine boards and some of the bearers wrapped handkerchiefs around their faces. Death was not dignified. We hacked a ragged grave in the unfriendly earth and fired a ragged volley over the grave. You could tell from our listlessness no one much missed him. This is a quiet sector of a quiet front. There is no poison gas and no HE. But when they shelled the other end of the village and the streets were choked with dust, women came screaming out of the crumbling houses, clutched under one arm the naked rump of an infant. I thought, how ugly fear is. This is a quiet sector of a quiet front. Our nerves are steady. We all sleep soundly. In the clean hospital bed, my eyes were so heavy, sleep easily blotted out one ugly picture, a wounded militiaman moaning on a stretcher, now out of danger but still crying for water, strong against death but unprepared for such pain. This on a quiet front. But when I shook hands to leave, an anarchist worker said, Tell the workers of England this was a war not of our own making. We did not seek it. But if ever the fascists again rule Barcelona, it will be as a heap of ruins with us workers beneath it. I have a photograph of him here. He is astonishingly, or was astonishingly, good-looking. A matinee, 
idle kind of handsomeness with a kind of touch of the, the gypsy about him. It, it all sounds, and he looks more like the stuff of legend than of reality, and as though his life is more for what he might have been than what he was. Are you remembering him for what he was or what he might have been? Both, um, but I do agree. There is a James Dean uh, look about mm. him, uh, though he was a rebel with a cause. But he is devilishly handsome, dashing in every respect, uh, with his uh, long black coat trailing behind him in Cambridge as he rushed from meeting to lecture hall to eating loaves of bread and discussing politics and philosophy and poetry and literature in general with his fellows. Uh, as someone who has only ever spoken at the Cambridge Union and the Oxford Union never had the advantage of studying there, it all adds up to an incredibly romantic picture for me. And I admit freely that I'm romanticising him, but I think he is the stuff of, uh, of historical romance. When I compare him with teenagers today, the number of books that he read, the number of pieces that he wrote, the number of poems that he was an expert in and could criticise from almost a professorial uh, standpoint, it's breathtaking. Let's bring in our expert now, Professor Stan Smith, Research Professor in Literary Studies at Nottingham Trent University. He's a student, critic and interpreter particularly of modern poetry and the author of a huge body of acclaimed work, some of it pretty controversial, on 20th century English poets. Stan, can you set the scene for us in 1936? Remind us why a young British man like Cornford was in Spain at all. In 1936, a popular front government of leftists and liberals and uh, middle-of-the-road political parties was elected uh, democratically in Spain. And within a few months, there was an insurrection led by General Franco and General Mola against the legitimately elected government, uh, the loyalists, the Republican government, uh, invading Spain from the Canary Islands and from North Africa, where Spain had uh, its colonial armies, to overthrow that government so that it looked as if it was going to be another one of those um, short-lived military coups that would replace uh, democracy. But in fact, the people of Spain gathered together, rose up, armed themselves. Uh, civilian populations, popular militias were formed to resist Franco's armies. So that the, the romanticism of that moment, the sheer simple heroism, mm. uh, is, is what I think stirred the imagination of, of these young men. I think the concept of resistance to fascism was incredibly attractive to that generation. Here were the jackboots coming closer to us. We had a chance to stop them. Uh, the whole great sweep and grandeur of Spain, the Spanish terrain, Barcelona and Madrid and so on, it was, I think, tremendously uh, magnetic for that uh, generation. And when people went there and they, the, the dispatches that they sent uh, back proved a pole of attraction for Cambridge intellectuals and Clydeside shipyard workers. So uh, much more than a gap year. So much more than a gap year, and never again repeated mm. such a cross-class commitment to a single cause. Never really again appeared. Uh, it was true to some extent of the Second World War, though not as true, and never again appeared in our history, and may never. George, how did he die? He was shot in the head uh, near Cordoba, at the front, leading men. He had a brief military career, but a very impressive one. All the reports from the front and from his contemporaries were that he took to soldiering well. He was physically very big and strong, and uh, he was a natural leader of men. And uh, despite not speaking French or Spanish, and therefore being cut off from the other, if you like, officer class, if you could describe it as such, of or the International Catalan. Brigade or mm. Catalan, his sheer force of personality kept forcing him to the front as a leader. And uh, there are many examples given in the limited literature about his time in Spain which show his war service in a heroic light. And you can imagine him on his 21st birthday, not knowing that the, the next day would bring his uh, death. He was uh, writing poetry and letters back to his love, Margot Heinemann, herself quite a famous figure on the left through many decades, one of the daughters of the Heinemann uh, publishing uh, empire. 
which showed that he was a mortal person. He uh, was frightened, he was lonely, he was bored. Uh, he doesn't uh, paint his service in uh, in in Spain as as being any kind of a Hollywood uh, uh, movie, a whirlwind of action, and so on. There were many many long hours of tedium, but nonetheless, when the call came, he went to the front and he was machine gunned by fascist gunners at Cordoba. I'm struck by that Im- image you suggest of him on the eve of his death, though he didn't know it on his twenty first birthday. Stan, how close an intimation may he have had of impending mortality? Well, Auden, in his poem Spain, talks about these young men presenting their presenting, lives. Presenting, that's right, yeah. yes. I, I think uh, Cornford, with that belief in his own immortality that young men have, didn't actually take very seriously the, the, the possibility of his death. He used to he put up percentages on it in his letters <laughs> back he? to <laughs> Margot. He, he would say that uh, I have a 50% chance of coming back unwounded mm. and a 25% chance was the case in 36, though not by the end of the war, of coming back dead. I feel sure I'll see you again, but if I don't, then be happy, my darling. It were very wonderful love letters to Margot Heinemann. Let's listen to another of his poems written from Spain, Full Moon at Tierre, before the storming of Huesca. It's a long poem, so here's an extract from it, incidentally read by Harold Pinter in 1965. Though communism was my waking time... Always before, the lights of home shone clear and steady and full in view. Here, if you fall, there's help for you. Now, with my party, I stand quite alone. Then let my private battles with my nerves, the fear of pain whose pain survives, the love that tears me by the roots, the loneliness that claws my guts, fuse in the welded front our fight preserves. Oh, be invincible as the strong sun, hard as the metal of my gun. I let the mounting tempo of the train sweep where my footsteps slipped in vain, October in the rhythm of its run. This is BBC Radio 4, and you're listening to Great Lives. My guest today is George Galloway, who's chosen the poet, communist and Spanish civil warrior John Cornford as his great life. With us as our guide is Professor Stan Smith. You have, Stan, in that poem, the elements of two different constructions mm. of the man, you know, hard as the metal of my gun suggests the uh, warrior with uh, no doubts, no hesitation, but there's, there's plenty there too about fragility and loneliness. Do you think, uh, as George suggests, that he was just cut out to be a warrior? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think he was cu- probably cut out to be a hero, but um, I think what the key line in that uh, passage for me is, now with my party I stand quite alone which is peculiarly contradictory kind of uh, situation. On the one hand, he's with his party, he's got solidarity and he's merged with the collective, and yet he stands alone. And I think that anxiety is actually at the core of, uh, of his political commitment and the, and the core of his commitment to the war. You have to bear in mind also that he was in Spain twice. He first became a casualty of food poisoning and was sent home to recover. But when he returned to Spain, brought ten of his friends whom he personally recruited... Uh, who became part of the core of the... Uh, so so the, the temporary repatriation due to illness, which many people might have taken as a, uh, an excuse for never coming back, he, in fact, redoubles his determination. And to I, take I, I more think people he uh, back cut off his scholarship yes. and everything and just he did, threw everything He won a it. scholarship through his academic brilliance. He mm. resigned it uh, in quite a gracious way, actually apologising to the Dons for having not been able to come personally to tell them, but that he was going back to Spain. And uh, funnily enough, his favourite period of the Spanish Civil War was the defence of the university in Madrid Mm -hmm. because for the first time they were out of the cold and in the dry, but most importantly they were able to ransack the library for all the great treasures and works in the library and they used to sit under fascist gunfire reading to each other from the Everyman series in the uh, library of the University of Madrid. So you have this extraordinary time when uh, all these workers from around the world are in a sense being taught, lectured to and uh, having access perhaps for the first time to great works of literature taken from the library of a university which is being reduced to rubble and ash by the forces of darkness. Those books also had a 
a rather more practical use as well, because the, the particularly the philosophy tomes, which were so thick, were uh, used as um, sandbagging against uh, bullets. Yes, yes, and in fact, one of his friends commented that um, you know there was nothing better than a book of German philosophy to resist a German bullet. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, though, George, uh, of Stan's suggestion that there was some kind of intellectual doubt or hesitation about him at the end or before the end? I think that he must have. Well, I, I, I hypothesize that he looked at the life of the other communists in his time at Cambridge, who'd all gone off to the Foreign Office mm. and uh, the special intelligence services of the British state to burrow away as moles, uh, well-fed, well-watered, and even well-paid for the privilege. Well, here he was <laughs> on the front at Aragon or elsewhere. There must have been moments when he wondered if this was just too sacrificial. He, I think, probably imagined a role for himself in the leadership of the communist movement if he survived uh, Spain, because he must have known that he was intellectually and in every way head and shoulders above many of the other leaders of the party at that time. Even as such a young man, I imagine that he saw a political future for himself, and he was in peril as was ultimately proved with a bullet uh, in the head. So it would be a strange man who had no such doubts. And it's one of the things I find most attractive uh, about him. His writing home isn't gung-ho. It isn't, oh, what a lovely war. Mm. Am and I enjoying this? He talks about his friends being torn and killed. He talks about a fascist that he personally killed in the university. And the battle uh, against my Madrid. nerves, an expression that yes, he uses. Yes, battle against his uh, nerves, standing alone. Hard as gun metal, yes, but uh, even gun metal has its uh, testing uh, temperatures. We, we've got a pretty good snapshot, perhaps, now of the, the man as he was when he was cut down. Now, let's wind right back to the beginning, because he had, didn't he, Stan, an extremely privileged upbringing. Yes, I, he came from a, a very privileged academic family in Cambridge. His father, uh, Francis Cornford, a classical scholar, and his mother, Francis with an E. Cornford, uh, granddaughter of Charles Darwin and um, a, an accomplished poet herself who um, instilled the love of poetry in John at an early age. A family uh, associated with Trinity College, Cambridge, for many generations, and of course it was Trinity that uh, John himself went to, Trinity, that great home of the Cambridge spies, in fact, and um, went to Stowe School, which is a, a newly founded public school, not particularly progressive, but um, with enough leeway for his kind of um, free play of the mind. He, he refused to join the Officer Training Corps, but at the age of 16, when he'd already joined the Young Communist League, he decided he had enough of school, went up to London, lived close to Red Lion Square, where there were lots of uh, left-wing bookshops, which he regularly frequented, attended the LSE for lectures by all those left-wing academics who um, he wanted to learn from, met a young woman, Rachel Peters, Ray Peters, daughter of a Welsh miner, and set up a quite long-term relationship with her. Um, she joined him in Cambridge when he went up to Trinity, and by whom he had a son. Uh, I, I want to ask you about uh, Ray Peters in just a moment, but, but first this, uh, George, up until this point, and indeed up until he decides to drop everything and go off and sacrifice himself in war, it's a fairly stereotyped tale. Public school boy, privileged background, rebel at university. God, I was surrounded by them myself at Cambridge. They were all going to change the world. They were all Marxists or Trotskyites. They were all going to be social workers or revolutionaries. And a few years later, I, I went to all their Church of England <laughs> weddings and saw them revert to type. This man didn't revert to type. What was different about him? Well, I, I think the earliness of his conversion to socialism as an idea, his determination that action speaks louder than words, even though words were his life's blood, his parents' life's blood, uh, words were everywhere around him. He was reading them and writing them. He still believed that action spoke louder than words. It's unlikely that he would have been one of those who would have abandoned that uh, path. I like to think he might have modified uh, because, of course, uh, we know now what Cornford couldn't be expected to know now, much more about the Stalin period and the role of the Comintern and the many crimes that took place in the Soviet Union in that period. Uh, he can't have known of them and can't be expected to. I like to think that he would have drawn the right conclusions from them. I even see him, 
you know, in my mind's eye, entering Parliament as a, as a Labour MP in the 1950s, had he survived. There were many left-wing Labour MPs at that time of a communist background, John Strachey and others, with whom he would have fitted very well. Do you think there was an element of class guilt uh, in his revolutionary fervour? He had a, a polemic with his mother about how nice a group of uh, building workers on their land had been to his sister. His mother asked him, should the workers have been rude to your sister? Because, after all, she was the representative of the ruling class that was employing these men. And he, he actually enters into a to-and-fro with his mother, that, no, they should have been correct with her, but they should not have been slavish to her. There may have been, but I think the sheer gigantic force of his intellectuality... It's astounding. He was a father at 17 and dead at 21. Yes, father at 17. You mentioned that, uh, Stan. Uh, he, he got his girlfriend, Ray Peters, pregnant, and, and then, then he abandoned her and the baby. It was a, it was a bit of a caddish thing to do, isn't no, it? No, I don't think that. It was, it was a separation by mutual agreement. There was a streak of ruthlessness in, in Cornford, and um, there is a letter in which he writes to Ray Peters and makes it clear that... Um, you know, they, they have to go their separate ways. But the, the child was adopted by his mother and father and brought up by them. And I don't think there was any bad blood between... Ray Peters was a tough young woman herself, and she was part of that generation of liberated women who were very strongly political. She was a Communist Party member. I think it's interesting that um, for all her liberalism, uh, Cornford's mother felt very insecure about having a working-class uh, girl in, in the family, as it were, as well as in the family way. <laughs> <laughs> Margot Heinemann was the great love of his life, and I suppose the woman he would have married if he hadn't been killed. And here's a recording of Margot herself reading one of his poems just before she died in 1991. Heart of the heartless world, dear heart, the thought of you is the pain at my side, the shadow that chills my view. The wind rises in the evening, reminds that autumn is near. I am afraid to lose you. I am afraid of my fear. On the last mile to Huesca, the last fence for our pride, think so kindly, dear, that I sense you at my side. And if bad luck should lay my strength into the shallow grave, remember all the good you can. Don't forget, my love. I've never heard Margot's voice before. That's incredibly moving, because, of course, this poem is a love poem to her heart of the heartless world of course drawn from Marx's opium uh, religion being the opium of the people the last uh, sigh of the oppressed the heart of the heartless world these are very beautiful lines and to have them read by a woman a year away from death to whom they were written is very moving uh, for me while he lived uh, while he wrote and and while he fought there was nothing unpatriotic in resisting fascism in the way that he did. Had he lived longer, had he survived the Spanish Civil War, he might well have come back and, had he remained the fervent communist that he was, found his patriotism, his British patriotism, in some way tested, or, or am I speculating Only too briefly, far? Uh, I think, you know, Pollitt resigned from the secretaryship of the Communist Party over the Soviets' change in line towards uh, Hitler. Uh, after the uh, pact, and only came back again as the party secretary once the line had changed again. I like to think, partly because I think he was close to Pollitt, that he would have taken the same line. And, of course, like many other communists of that generation, uh, uh, again, Cambridge people like him, Klugman and others, he would have thrown himself into the Second World War with gusto. If he hadn't been a fine poet... I wonder if we'd have noticed his soldiering, and if he hadn't been a brave soldier, I wonder whether we would have noticed his poetry, and, and if he hadn't been astonishingly good-looking, I wonder whether we would have noticed him at all, and if he hadn't been cut down, I wonder whether he might have ended up as fat and some, bald and short of... An apparatchik of some kind. Perhaps I really he was don't... just lucky that all these things intersected well, in, in at the in the way right that point. James Dean uh, was, uh, was lucky in that sense, uh, maybe, but I doubt it. I think this person was cut from the the finest cloth. I think he he was uh, Byronic in his uh, persona in every way and would have gone on uh, to be so. Perhaps he might have perished in the Second World War 
or he, if he'd survived that, he'd have gone into the Cold War period, been shunned and marginalised in the way that people on the left uh, were. Uh, You've no doubt that he would have uh, kept the faith with I, I the Communist Party. I have personally Party. none. Uh, uh, with the Communist Party, I don't know. But with the left, I'm perfectly sure. Do you think that he was starting out on the same sort of political and ideological journey that your own life has traversed? Uh, very much, but from an extraordinarily different uh, background. Mm. I'm neither tall nor Byronic nor the grandson, great-grandson of uh, Charles Darwin. Uh, didn't go to such schools or universities and so on. But, uh, of course, I identify with his political uh, trajectory. And if I had been alive at the time, I would have been with him in Spain. Because I think that for such a young man to reach, independently of the party, by the way, he was ahead of the party in the concept of the International Brigade, that fascism could be stopped in Spain, and that if it wasn't stopped in Spain, we would all pay a fantastically higher price to stop it later. This was also uh, a, an analysis uh, which I share. And of course, if instead of a so-called policy of neutrality, which was effectively a policy in support of the fascist rebellion, then we might have stopped Hitlerism in Spain and not had to sacrifice 100 million lives later in order to do it. Do you ever wish, George Galloway, that you yourself uh, had been sent a cause in which you could personally have fought, or, or do you sometimes think you should have fought in well, one in of a way, I'm, In a way, I'm fighting. I'm not fighting in risking my life, and I'm not fighting with a gun, but I'm fighting uh, causes that I believe in, that I believe that Cornford, if he'd lived in this era, would also have believed in. I'm sacrificing not my life's blood, but the best years of my life. I'm doing uh, what I can. But if a cause like Spain were to emerge again, God forbid, I would be there. But what about the American occupation of Iraq, for instance? Is that not worth fighting against? I think the fight against the American occupation of Iraq is one I've waged on a different level. Yes. Uh, and uh, reasonably effectively brought to an end the British involvement in that occupation with my friends in the anti-war movement. Uh, we're trying to do the same thing uh, with our occupation of Afghanistan. We're fighting the anti-war cause in a, in a different way. But I, I'm not a, I think you know, a cowardly person, and if the moment arose, I would be there. My thanks to George Galloway for introducing us to the short life of John Cornford and to our expert witness, Professor Stan Smith. Goodbye.